recording stop. Okay, Dorothy, take us away. Good evening, everyone. On behalf of our State League staff and our speakers, welcome to the first of three sessions of the 2023 League of Women Voters of Wisconsin Issues Briefing. We're glad you came and you will be too. I'm Dorothy Skye, president of the State League Board. Tonight, the focus is on redistricting in Wisconsin. It has become our tradition to start major gatherings with a land acknowledgement to help create a proper framework and grounding for subsequent exploration of Wisconsin's political scene. In doing so, we recognize the necessity to include Wisconsin's Indian tribal members and tribal governments in our cooperative educational and advocacy efforts. These maps remind us how our 20 plus leagues locations relate to the Native Americans former and currently recognized tribal lands. Note that the remaining na native reservations are mere remnants demarcated by the tiny gray patches on the map on the left side of the slide. This year's, this, yeah, this issue's briefings land acknowledgement is tied to recognition of Ada Deer, who walked on into her next life on August 15th, 2023, at the age of 88, so just this summer. She devoted her life to saving Indian sovereign lands and enhancing the well being of her Menominee people and American Indians throughout our state and our nation. She was a tireless and brilliant tactician who embodied the fact that Native, Native Americans collective personhood is tied to their place on the land. Education was key to Ada Deer's personal achievements. It was also the focus of her contribution to her people. In 1957, she was the first Menominee tribal member to graduate from UW-Madison. She continued her formal education at Columbia University, where in 1961, she was the first Native American to graduate with a master's degree in social work. Ada Deer's subsequent career intermingled teaching, social work, and politics, all with emphasis on the betterment of her Menominee people and all Native Americans. She was instrumental in passage of the Federal Menominee Restoration Act of 1973 that began to reverse preceding legislative attempts to obliterate Menominee sovereignty, culture, language, religion, and identity. She traveled to Washington, DC to help successfully lobby for, pass for passage of the Restoration Act. Other federal acts in which she had a hand furthered American Indian cultural and economic viability. And you can see on that map on the right, well, you can see on the left-hand map, if you focus, you can see there's a remarkable green patch of forest. That's the Menominee tribal lands. And it's the same one that's outlined in that little black square on the map on the right. Menominee elder Ver Dr. Verna Fowler walked on into her next life on August 12th of 2023, just three days before Ada Deer. It almost seems they plan to synchronize their departure. As contemporaries and fellow Menominee tribal members, Deer and Fowler worked together to lobby for the Menominee Restoration Act. I bet they're both walking together now, even as we speak. Dr. Fowler was also remarkable for advancing opportunities for post-secondary education for Native Americans in our state. She founded the College of the Menominee Nation in Kashina and Green Bay and served as its president for over 24 years. To learn more about these two remarkable women, you might begin with tributes to them in a recent issue of the Menominee Indian Tribal News. Brandy's gonna put that in the chat. And I also recommend Ada Deer's memoir. Making a Difference, My Fight for Native Rights and Social Justice. And Brandy will also put that in the chat. With inspiration from these two heroic promoters of Native, Native American sovereignty and education, and in fact, the common good of us all, let us proceed with the League of Women Voters of Wisconsin's 2023 Issues Briefing. 
reminders, uh, please keep yourselves muted uh, unless you ask a question during the Q&A session. You can put your uh, questions in the chat and we will bring them forward during the Q&A. And as Brandy said at the beginning, these sessions are being recorded and will be available for the general public. To start off our exploration and update of redistricting in Wisconsin, I'll invite Joan Schwartz to the virtual podium. Joan is a retired attorney. She's currently secretary of the League of Women Voters of Wisconsin Board of Directors. She also chairs the State League's Impartial Justice and Nonpartisan Redistrict Committee, as well as serving on the State League's Legislative Committee where her portfolio emphasis includes election law, gerrymandering, voting, and money in politics. So Joan Schwartz, take it away. Thank you, Dorothy. I'm going to provide a brief history of Wisconsin's legislative map since 2011. Some of you will know this history of our maps very well, but I will provide some legal analysis of the decisions of the Wisconsin Supreme Court and the US Supreme Court that resulted in the gerrymandered maps we now have. Then attorney Dan Lenz of Law Ford will provide an update on the lawsuit filed with the Wisconsin Supreme Court, <clears throat> excuse me, Clark v. Wisconsin Elections Commission. And we will then hear from Dee Sweet and Anne Marie McClellan, two petitioners in the Clark case. Uh, next slide. The new census data from 2020 showed violations of the U.S. Constitution's one person, one vote requirement. Law Forward, a progressive law firm, filed federal redistricting litigation. Following that following, that filing, Wisconsin Law and Liberty, known as Will, a conservative law firm, asked the state Supreme Court to decide redistricting. Instead, as an original action, in the event the legislature and governor could not agree on the new state legislative and congressional maps. In September 2021, the Supreme Court agreed to the original action filed by will that allowed the court to take jurisdiction of the redistricting process. Next slide. Citizens in Wisconsin worked hundreds of hours to produce fair maps consistent with the Wisconsin Constitution. Governor Evers ordered the creation of the People's Maps Commission, an advisory redistricting body designed to be a vehicle for public input and engagement. The commissioners heard from 2,000 Wisconsinites representing 68 counties and 321 municipalities, as well as engaging 18 redistricting experts from across the United States and Wisconsin. The commissioner took special care, the commission took special care to recognize and respect various communities of interest. The Wisconsin Fair Maps Coalition was formed in 2017. Chaired by the League of Women Voters Executive Director, Deborah Cromwiller, the coalition was very active in both lobbying the legislature and providing testimony to the Governor's People's Maps Commission. The commission held public hearings across the state and solicited input from a wide range of stakeholders, including members of the public, interest groups, and local officials. The commission's goal was to create a fair and transparent redistricting process in contrast to the legislature's closed door approach. The coalition, co coalition held dozens of training courses using something called Districter and submitted over 1,000 community of interest maps, organized 17 simultaneous rallies at the Capitol and around the state with more than 1,000 participants, calling on the legislature and court to create fair voting map. Next slide. Cities, counties, and municipalities all over Wisconsin drew maps for their communities. I was a member of the Dane County and Madison Redistricting Commission. Our work involved making sure we incorporated these constitutional requirements in the maps that we drew, paying strict attention that districts would be contiguous and compact. We worked hours and hours. Of note is that before 2011, cities, towns, and municipalities in Wisconsin drew their own maps and then forwarded them to the legislature for incorporation in their maps. However, after 2011, the legislature passed a bill which mandated that the legislature draw its maps first and that all cities, towns, and municipalities would conform their maps to what the legislature had created. With this change, the redistricting process in Wisconsin was turned on its head. Governor Scott Walker signed the legislation and this is still the law today. Next slide. 
ultimately the legislature drew its own maps without using the input from all of us across the state. Governor Evo's Governor Evers vetoed the maps the legislature's produced after calling them gerrymandering 2.0, referring to the gerrymandered maps of 2011. The legislature did not override Governor Evers' veto. Much more will be discussed about this issue later. Next slide. The case that Will filed and the state Supreme Court accepted for original jurisdiction was called Johnson versus Wisconsin Elections Commission. An original jurisdiction, often referred to as original action, is a constitutional provision which provides that the Wisconsin Supreme Court is the court of first resort on all judicial questions affecting the sovereignty of the state, the franchises or prerogatives, or the liberties of the people. In other words, a lawsuit does not begin in the circuit courts where a trial ensues. Had the redistricting case begun at the circuit court, there would have been an evidentiary trial where all the maps submitted for review would have been introduced into evidence and all witnesses and experts would have been subjected to cross-examination. After such an evidentiary trial, the judge would have ruled on the maps. Subsequently, the party who lost then would have been able to appeal to the Court of Appeals. That's a mandatory appeal and the Court of Appeals would have had to take that case. And then the person party that would lose at the Court of Appeals could appeal to the Wisconsin Supreme Court. That's a discretionary appeal. They take the cases they choose to. Even without such an evidentiary trial, the court in an original action can appoint a special master or referee who conducts a mini evidentiary hearing, which in a complex case like redistricting, fact finding is quite important. The Supreme Court, however, did not appoint a special master and there was no evidentiary hearing. Next slide. <clears throat> in November 2021, the Wisconsin Supreme Court first issued an opinion in, Wisconsin, in Johnson versus Wisconsin Elections Commission, in which it adopted criteria for the redistricting process. It said that instead of crafting their own maps, the party should submit one proposed map for each set of districts where new district boundaries were required. They then instructed the parties that they would choose maps that would minimize changes from current law, that is the 2011 maps, in issuing what they called the least change mandate. They said that they rejected an approach that involved the court from making significant policy decisions or weighing competing policy criteria, as well as refusing to consider the partisan makeup of proposed districts that is, the court decided that it should not take into account projections of the likely political impact of the maps. They said that by focusing on legal requirements only and using the 2011 maps currently reflected in Wisconsin law, they were seeking to minimize their involvement in the numerous policy and political decisions inherent in map drawing. They emphasized that the court would, quote, tread no further than necessary to remedy current legal deficiencies, unquote. While all these stated reasons sound plausible, the net effect of mandating the least change from the 2011 maps, the court forced all the parties to make minimal changes to the highly gerrymandered maps of 2011. Of course, as the dissent argued that using legal ch least change of the 2011 maps would nullify the Wisconsin vote since 2011 and will per perpetuate 2011's gerrymandering far into the future as long as Republicans control one political branch. It's no, no supporting why this least change mandate to the 2011 maps virtually guaranteed that the maps drawn in 2022 would also be gerrymandered. Shocking as it was, in 2011, the Republican-controlled legislature drew the legislative districts in a highly political and secret way at a law firm, which was paid $1.9 million of taxpayer dollars. The law firm used Democratic specialists and computer experts to draw its maps. The secret process did not allow for any public input or public meetings. Governor Scott Walker, of course, approved these maps. The legislature then spent another $3 million of taxpayer money to defend these secret maps. Also important to note is that the least change mandate imposed when upon all the parties is not one of the constitutional criteria for redistricting. The constitutional criteria included under the Wisconsin uh, Constitution, 
means that the districts are to be contiguous, sufficiently equal in population, sufficiently compact, and pay due respect to local boundaries. Unfortunately, the Supreme Court's creating the least change mandate created a thin veer of impartiality while entrenching an extreme gerrymander that reinforced the racial and partisan power, power of the past. Next slide. The state Supreme Court premised their decision on a misguided assumption about cause and effect, which has been referred to as natural packing. This assumption is that, quote, Democrats tend to live together in urban areas and Republicans tend to disperse in rural and suburban areas, and that compact districts therefore lead to grouping by numbers of Democrats in few districts and dispersing rural Republicans among several. In fact, natural cracking is not what caused the maps we have. Intentional packing and cracking define the current maps. Packing refers to the process of forcing as many members of the opposing party into as few districts as possible to minimize the number of districts that would be given to the opposition. Cracking refers to splitting members of the majority party into as many districts as possible to get as close to 51% in as many districts as possible so that the majority party wins. The results of packing and cracking are plainly obvious in Wisconsin's maps. Since 2012, even when Democrats have won as much as 53% of the statewide vote, they've held no more than 39 of the 99 assembly seats. In the same period, even when Republicans have won as little as 44.8% of the statewide vote, they have held no fewer than 60 of the 99 assembly seats. Next slide. In March, after oral arguments, the Wisconsin Supreme Court selected Governor Abers representative in congressional maps. It decided that the governor's proposed maps complied with the federal constitution's population equality requirement, satisfied the requirements of the state and federal constitutions, and produced the mandate of least change to the 2011 maps. Governor Evers' legislative maps increased the number of majority minority black assembly districts from six to seven due to the increase in the black population in Milwaukee. In its selection of Governor Evers' maps, the Wisconsin Supreme Court also addressed the issue of the Voting Rights Act. A few words are in order about the Voting Rights Act. The purpose of it is to prohibit, was to prohibit racial discrimination in voting, it was intended to help protect the right to vote for racial minorities throughout the country by prohibiting voting practices or procedures that discriminate on the basis of race, color, or membership in a minority group. A few words are also in order here about to describe what a majority minority Black voting district is. It's a subdivision in which one or more racially ethnic and or religious minority um, makes up a majority of the local population. Voting districts that are designed under the Voting Rights Act to enable racial, ethnic, or language minorities provide them, quote, the opportunity to elect their candidate of choice. Next slide. Specific language from the majority opinion is important to note because on appeal to opinion, namely, the admission of the lack of an evidentiary record in accepting Governor Evers' creation of a seventh majority minority district. The majority opinion stated the following, quote, the VRA Voting Rights Act, when triggered, may require the race conscious drawing of majority minority districts. But our task is to produce districts in the first instance without the benefit of a trial and a fully developed factual record regarding the performance of specific districts. Here, we cannot say for certain on this record that seven majority minority districts are required by the Voting Rights Act, but based on our assessment of the totality of the circumstances and given the discretion afforded states implementing act, we conclude the governor's configuration is permissible. On this record, we therefore conclude selecting a map with seven districts is within the leeway states have to take actions reasonably judged necessary to prevent vote dilution under the Voting Rights Act. Next slide. Wisconsin Law and Liberty and the legislature appealed the decision to the U.S. Supreme Court. March 2022, the Supreme Court issued a 7-2 decision that the governor's attempt to improve Black representation in the state legislature was an Ill illegal racial gerrymander that violated the Constitution's equal protection guarantees. 
in its rejection of Governor Evers' maps, the U.S. Supreme Court focused on the statement in the majority opinion that said, we cannot say for certain on this record that seven majority minority Black assembly districts are required. It held that the Wisconsin Supreme Court had misapplied the test that allows map makers to consider race when drawing districts. It also held that racial minorities drove the governor's selection of district lines, and the Wisconsin Supreme Court wrongly relied on insufficient evidence to endorse such race-based decision-making. Specifically, the Supreme Court stated that the governor, quote, provided no, almost no other evidence or analysis supporting his claim that the Voting Rights Act required the seven majority minority districts that he drew and thus failed to present evidence that a race-based remedy was necessary under the Voting Rights Act. Next slide. The U.S. Supreme Court then remanded the case back to the Wisconsin Supreme Court for further proceedings regarding its Senate and Assembly maps. It explained the Wisconsin Supreme Court could choose from among other submissions, or it could take additional evidence if it preferred to reconsider the governor's maps. On a man on April 15th, Justice Hagedorn, who had written the majority opinion and had been joined by the three justices considered to be liberal, changed his position and joined with the three justices considered to be conservative. This new majority, uh, this majority on the Supreme Court agreed with the highest court, that indeed the record at its court had insufficient evidence to justify drawing state legislative maps on the basis of race. Even though the Wisconsin Supreme Court could have taken additional evidence, it chose not to. In doing so, the Wisconsin Supreme Court held that any map drawn for racial reasons was unconstitutional, and that since only the legislative maps were race blind, they argued the legislative maps won by default. And so Wisconsin was redistricted under the legislative legislative map, the same one the government governor had vetoed almost five months earlier. The Constitution separation of powers doctrine was actually triggered by this decision, since the Wisconsin Supreme Court accepted legislative maps that Governor Evers had vetoed, but which the legislature had not overridden. A very important issue that Attorney Dan Lenz will address in his presentation. Next slide. Now. All issues important to Wisconsin's are controlled by the legislature's maps. What this means is that under the 2022 maps, the legislature reduced Milwaukee's six majority minority districts that had existed in the 2011 maps down to five districts, despite the increase in the black population in Milwaukee as demonstrated in the 2020 census. Secondly, also under the 2022 maps, 54 of the 99 assembly districts and 21 of the 33 Senate districts violate the constitution requirement of being contiguous. Third, and most significantly, in the 2022 election, Republicans won 64 of 99 assembly seats and saw victories that yielded 22 of 23 Senate seats, a supermajority in the Senate and just one seat shy of being able to override any of Governor Evers' vetoes on any legislation. Essentially, we now have one of the most gerrymandered maps in the nation, a representative map that has manipulated the boundaries of many districts in favor of one political party over the other. We know that fair maps and voting rights are the same fight. Bottom line, our current maps do not represent what Wisconsinites have demanded when myriad counties and municipalities pass board resolutions and countywide referendum by overwhelming majorities and call the legislators to pass legislation creating a nonpartisan redistricting process, all to no avail. Law Forward filed a lawsuit, Park v. W. Wisconsin Election Commissions, for an original action at the Wisconsin Supreme Court in order to declare these gerrymandered maps is unconstitutional. On this one, Wisconsin Supreme Court has accepted the case for original jurisdiction. Depending on the outcome of this case, new maps could be in place for the 2024 election. Now, with us to provide a legal perspective on the Wisconsin redistricting lawsuit is attorney Dan Lenz from Law Forward. Dan has over a decade of litigation experience, including extensive experience, expertise, in election law. 
Thank you for joining us, Dan. Well, thank you, Joan, um, and thanks for having me. I'm so thrilled to be here with the with the league as part of its issues briefing. Um, and I'll, I'll put up a slideshow in a sec and, and walk through it, but um, I will just say personally, um, I see a number of friendly faces. I see a lot of new faces. Um, having this level of involvement, this level of interest and excitement around this issue uh, means the world to us, as does the league's historic partnership. Um, I've had the honor of representing the league in a number of matters. Uh, we represent the league in a number of matters right now. Um, and I don't think it is is going too far to say that our work would not be possible without the league's partnership, without the league's leadership in this space um, that that predates Law Forward by over a century. Um, and, um, you know, to, to present to you tonight is really an honor. Um, so I am going to quickly see if I can share my screen. Bear with me for one sec. All right, can folks see? Oh, hopefully not my inbox. Um, there we go. All right, can folks see my slideshow? Yes. Great, thanks, Joan. Okay, um, so uh, as Joan mentioned, my name's Dan Lenz. I'm staff counsel at Law Forward. Uh, I'll give you, uh, for those who don't know, a little bit of information about us. Uh, law Forward is a progressive law firm and advoca advocacy organization founded in October of 2020, right before the 2020 election, that's focused on uh, democracy issues in the state of Wisconsin. We are Wisconsin-based. Uh, we all live here. Uh, we are strictly focused on the issues in our state, and that is more than enough to keep us busy, certainly. Um, you can see uh, my colleagues, uh, other staff counsel, legal fellows, uh, we grew from an organization with one staff council back in October of 2020 to now nine. Uh, and our our founders are Jeff Mandel and Doug Poland, who many of you probably know or have heard speak, um, who have been involved in these issues, uh, both on the nonpartisan and partisan side for many, many years um, and have been leaders in this space. Um, a little bit of background in terms of Law Forward's experience in the redistricting space. In the Johnson litigation that Joan just explained so well, we represented a number of individual and organizational plaintiffs, including the League, uh, in trying to uh, present maps, present remedies uh, in that litigation. Um, and then we kind of heard how that went. All right. Uh, here's our statement of what we do. Um, Law Forward is focused on systemic litigation, making big picture change really improving the structures of democracy in our state, uh, preferably in proactive ways, but also often responding to issues as they come up, responding to legislation, responding to anti-democratic anti litigation that unfortunately has been a theme uh, over the past couple of years, but uh, hopefully will be changing soon. Uh, that is a very nice view of how that work looks. I'll give you an actual view of how that work looks. This uh, was the result of about a two hour meeting we had um, about kind of the, the basic fundamental pre premises of what we do, uh, just to give you a sense of, of what our day to day is like, in addition to, you know, writing briefs and showing up in court from time to time. Okay, so I'm here tonight to talk about Clark versus Wisconsin Elections Commission, our case that's currently pending before the Wisconsin Supreme Court. That is a challenge to the existing state legislative maps, the assembly and Senate maps. Um, Law Forward, along with our co-counsel at the Elections Law Center at Harvard Law School, Arnold and Porter, the Campaign Legal Center, and Stafford Rosenbaum, uh, are honored to represent 19 individual petitioners, uh, two of whom you're going to hear from next, uh, Anne-Marie and Dee, and a number of whom are on this call, um, I'm, I'm always happy to see. Um, our petitioners are from all over the state, from the Southeast to the Northwest, from Douglas County, Bayfield County, Dane County, Kenosha County, uh, Sheboygan, all over the place, um, representing a huge array of backgrounds, a huge array of experiences, um, a huge array of districts, how these districts are composed, the issues we have with these districts, um, and all of whom uh, have, have been active in this space and have been willing to kind of jump on and help us with this effort. 
Um, the defendants in our case, the initial respondents in our case, uh, were, were the Wisconsin Elections Commission, which is the state agency that administers and enforces our election law and, in, you know, sets some of the rules around our elections and enforces the existing maps. They're a, they're a normal defendant in almost all of our cases. Um, we also named as respondents in our case, all the odd named senators or all, all the odd numbered senators, names notwithstanding, uh, all the odd numbered senators. Uh, and that's because one of our claims or one of our, our requests for relief in our case is a, that the court required there be special elections in 2024 under new maps for both houses of the legislature, for all members of both houses. Um, all of the assembly is normally up anyway in every general election, every you know election, um, and half of the Senate was going to be up. But to get the other half up, uh, so we have a full legislature based on constitutional maps required, in our opinion, naming the odd numbered senators. So they're in there as well. Um, since then, and I'll, I'll walk through the timeline in just a moment, there have been a number of interveners in our case, uh, folks who have come in and requested to become parties and have been granted party status in our case. Uh, that includes the legislature, uh, the governor, uh, some other petitioners from a from another case, and then also uh, some of the same individuals that were represented by the Wisconsin Institute for Law and Liberty in the Johnson matter are now part of our case. Bear with me for one sec. Okay. All right. Uh, as Joan mentioned, uh, we brought our case on August 2nd as an original action before the Wisconsin Supreme Court, requesting that the court take jurisdiction, um, and that is how it's proceeded. All right. So here's the timeline. Uh, when I first put this presentation together, it was much easier to read. Uh, it has gotten complicated since then. So I'll, I'll kind of briefly walk through it. Um, we filed our original action on August 2nd. On August 4th, a number of other petitioners filed a separate original action, uh, which included a number of, of the same or similar claims. Uh, they were at the time called the right petitioners. They're also sometimes called the citizens, ma citizen mathematicians and scientists. They had been parties to Johnson as well, um, and then filed a new action on, on August 4th. On August 15th, the Supreme Court issued a scheduling order, requested responses by a um, August 22nd. Um, that happened. A number of parties responded, uh, including the Democratic senators, the odd-numbered senators, the odd-numbered Republican senators who were represented by different attorneys. Um, WEC filed a response indicating that they didn't take a position on our petition, but that any new maps needed to be in place by March 15th. And then the legislature moved to intervene. At the same time, um, the legislature and the Republican senators also filed motions requesting that Justice Protasewicz, who had just been sworn in at that point, recuse herself from making any decisions in this case. There was a flurry of briefing after that. We filed briefs on August 29th. Uh, in response to that, there was then supplemental briefing on a separate issue. Um, and then we were waiting for a while to hear first from Justice Protasewicz and then from the court on our original action. We finally got that news on October 6th, uh, just a few, what is technically a few weeks ago, but seems like a lifetime ago to me at least. Um, around 5.15 on August 6th, we got, which was a Friday night, I was sitting at home, we got an order from Justice Protasewicz, uh, it was about 65 pages long, indicating why she believed that a recusal was inappropriate in this case. Um, and while we were reading that decision, about 10 minutes later, we got an order from the court uh, indicating that it was going to grant our petition in part and deny it in part. And I'll explain a little bit about what that means in a moment. Um, and then setting a scheduling order for briefing, as well as laying out the questions that the court believed the parties need to answer in their briefs. Um, uh, it set a number of other deadlines for additional intervention and amicus briefs. Um, all of which, as of yesterday, have passed, um, with one exception. Um, so on October 16th, all the parties at this point, which includes all the interveners, filed their initial briefs, answering these questions. On October 30th, uh, we all filed response briefs, responding to the other parties, um, why we believe they were right or wrong, where we agreed, where we disagreed. 
And then yesterday, November 8th, was the deadline for amicus briefs uh, to come in. I think there are about seven amicus briefs at the end of the day, including folks like the Fair Maps Coalition uh, filed a brief, which was wonderful. Um, other advocacy groups, um, the Coalition on Lead Emergency, um, various local officials, a number of others filed amicus briefs. All right. So before I get to, to what's likely to happen next, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about our claims. And, and before I get to, to what's on the slide, I should talk for a moment about uh, what all of our claims were when we filed uh, to give you a sense of where we've been and where we're going. So when we filed the petition for an original action in August, we made five claims, um, three of which were claims that the existing maps because of how they're composed, because they crack Democratic voters across the state and pack Democratic voters in other districts, uh, are partisan gerrymander, which kind of really no one disputes, right? The, these are the same maps, basically the same maps that courts have found to be a partisan gerrymander in 2011 and 2012 and 2015 in the, the Gill versus Whitford litigation that eventually went to the US Supreme Court. They're undisputably partisan gerrymanderings. And what we alleged in August was that because they're partisan gerrymanders, they violate various provisions of the Wisconsin Constitution. So those were three of our claims. They were based on three different provisions in our state constitution. The other two claims we made were a little bit more technical. Um, one um, that you can kind of see represented on this slide is our contiguity claim. And, and Joan spoke a little bit about this. The Wisconsin Constitution contains, among its other redistricting requirements, a plain requirement that our districts be contiguous. And that means they don't have detached parts, right? You, it's pretty simple. It's, it's you know, it's, it's third grade math. Um, contiguous means all together. Um, but most of our districts, uh, 54 of the 99 assembly districts, 21 of the 33 Senate districts are not contiguous. And we just have a representative example up here, Assembly District 2. You can see it has these little bubbles and islands that hang out there. These types of islands, um, for various historical reasons or just because it, it makes it easier to gerrymander, are present in most of our districts. Um, and we believe, um, and the text supports, that that's a plain violation of the Wisconsin Constitution. And the various ways that that, various reasons that's been ignored in the past don't hold water, um, that that the court really needs to take this requirement seriously um, and that these maps need to be thrown out on that basis. The other claim, more technical claim that we made uh, is that the existing maps for, for some of the reasons Joan described are a violation of our separation of powers doctrine. The Wisconsin Constitution, like most state constitutions, like our federal constitution, provides for three branches of government, legislative, executive, judicial, each of which has core powers that the others can't interfere with. And two of those powers are the ability to veto legislation, which is a power held by the governor and the executive branch, and the ability to override uh, vetoes, which is a power held by the legislative branch. The governor exercised his veto authority. No one disputes that he wasn't entitled to do so. And the legislature at the time chose not to override or was unable to override. They never even put it to a vote before the end of the Johnson litigation. And so we allege that by nonetheless reaching in and basically imposing a failed bill that had failed the political process, the court interfered with those powers of the other branches in the when it resolved Johnson in April of 2022. It basically took a law that had failed the lawmaking process and made it the law anyway. And we believe that that's a violation of separation of powers. Um, so where are we now? On October 6th, um, one of the things the court did was tell us, we are not at this time going to hear your partisan gerrymandering claims. We're not gonna hear these claims that you're making that the existing maps are unconstitutional because they're a partisan gerrymander. And the reason the court gave is, you know, it's only two sentences long was, we believe there's too much fact finding. The Wisconsin Supreme Court, while well, we kind of gave them ways that they could engage in that fact finding, uh, didn't decided not to do that. And and you know whether to take an original action is always discretionary with the court. But they said the other two claims seem to be legal claims, and they are. They're they're basic legal claims. The maps are what they are, and the process that occurred in Johnson is undisputed. 
And so we'll resolve those. Uh, the court also said that based, you know, depending on how that litigation works out, the other claims that you made might be moot. Um, and I can explain a little bit about why that is. Okay. Here are a couple more examples, uh, just because it is very helpful for contiguity of, of some other districts where you can really plainly see what the issue is, you know, how goofy these districts are. We have one, um, one petitioner who lives on one of these little islands, uh, not in one of these districts, and actually in 8047 here in Madison, um, that is just a blob that sits in the middle of 8048. Um, so to get to the rest of her district, she has to cross through 8048. Um, and, you know, it, it's, I, I say it's technical, but it's important. We, we believe that we should have districts that represent communities, that represent geographic locations, so those people can talk to their neighbors, can work with their neighbors, can debate, um, can organize, as we all are, are entitled to do, and to have their legislators respond. And if everyone's from kind of disparate locations and no one's sure who their representative is, that's not a good way uh, to have representative democracy in our state. Okay. Um, here are the four questions that the court asked us to answer. Um, and, and then I'll talk about uh, the sort of the remedial part. Number one, do the maps violate the contiguity requirement or are thus unconstitutional? Number two, do they violate separation of powers and are thus unconstitutional? And then number three and four are assuming that these maps are unconstitutional. What are the remedial criteria that the court needs to consider in imposing new maps? And the fourth question is, what's the fact-finding process around that? How is the court supposed to engage in that work? Um, and what we have told the court and what a number of, of the parties who are now in the case have told the court is there are, there are a number of kind of undisputed criteria, right? You need to have population equality in the districts. You need to have three assembly districts nested within a Senate district. Uh, districts are supposed to be compact. They need to be contiguous. Kind of all the basic requirements that that everyone more or less agrees on. Where there is some disagreement among the parties um, with kind of the us on one side and the folks who are represented by Will and the legislature on the other side are what is the court supposed to do about partisanship? And what we have said, and consistent with what federal courts in Wisconsin have said in the past, what state courts have said in the past, is when the court is imposing districts, what it needs to do is act like a court. And that means it can't increase the partisan skew or can't impose a skewed map that favors one partisan party or one entity over another. And to do that, the court needs to look at partisan information, needs to look what, at what these districts, how they'll actually perform, what they'll actually do, because it is possible, if not likely, that if you tried to draw districts blind, if you tried to draw them without reference to partisan information, you would accidentally impose a gerrymander one way or the other. Um, and we don't think that's an appropriate thing for this court or for any court to do. And so we have asked them to engage in that process to make sure that the maps that they're, that if they find the existing maps are unconstitutional, that any future map a court might impose is fair. Um, and we have a lot of reasons as to why they didn't do that in Johnson and, and need to do it now, um, but that's the basic, basic requirement. Okay, so uh, what happens next? Um, the only thing we know for certain that will happen next is that on November 21st at 9.45 a.m., there will be oral argument in the Supreme Court um, on the issues that, that the court has taken jurisdiction over. Um, each side will have 20 minutes to present their case and 10 minutes on rebuttal. Um, I expect, given the number of parties and the likelihood of you know anyone going over, this is going to last all day. It'll be available on Wisconsin Eye um, for those who want to watch, um, although everyone's also welcome in person. Um, it's an open court. Um, and then after that, we have some expectations of what the court will do. We expect answers from the court on these four questions, or at least the first two. Um, we don't know when. We have set forth schedules. Other parties have set forth schedules that are kind of assuming an answer by the beginning of next year, but it's up to the court. These are hard questions. Um, they involve a lot of work. And as we all sort of, as we all know, while there seems to be a lot of time between November 21st and January 1st, there are like three working days in there. Uh, and the court uh, has staff and they're human beings and, and have other things they need to do. So we're hoping to get an answer as quickly as possible 
on those questions so we can start on the remedial process um, because we believe these maps are plainly unconstitutional and need to be replaced. Um, and we believe the court needs to do that work expeditiously so we can have maps in place by you know mid-March of 2024 uh, in order to have them in place for the 2024 general election. All right. Uh, and I think the Q&A is going to be in a little bit. So I will turn it over now to Anne-Marie and Dee, or unless someone else from the league is going to jump in first. I'm sorry. I think Dorothy, Thank or I'm Thank sorry, you. Joan, yeah. yeah. Thank you, Dan. Now we'll hear from Dee Sweet and Anne-Marie McPollin who are both petitioners in the Wisconsin Redistricting Law School. Dee Sweet fosters civic engagement in tribal communities through voter registration. Anne-Marie McClellan has served as a poll worker in um, Menominee, as well as on the People's Maps Commission. Welcome. Hi. Um, Dee, do you, am I going first? I guess so. Um, my screen looks a little weird. Can you hear me okay? Am I up? Yep, we can hear you perfectly. Okay, because it's saying sign in in the corner, so I wasn't sure. Um, no, you're good to go. Okay, good. Um, I guess I've prepared remarks. I don't know, Dee, would you like to begin or? Uh, what is your pleasure? I'm happy to go, uh, <laughs> and I can also uh, go second. Oh. Either way, maybe I, I'm hopefully not too long. I'll just jump in here then. Um, and I, I guess uh, first I just wanted to thank um, both Joan and Dan for the details of the cases because it's so complex. It's um, always good to hear the details even over and over again, especially with the complex history of redistricting in Wisconsin. And um, I just want to give uh, a little introduction to myself and why I am a plaintiff in this particular case. Um, so I moved back up north in 2016 after spending 25 years of living in the south. I look forward to residing in this great state of Wisconsin that took great pride in progressive thought, education, and its beautiful natural resources. As many leaguers know, 103 years ago, Wisconsin was proudly the first state to ratify the 19th Amendment, giving women the right to vote with a significant omission of Native American and Black women. The Progressive Party movement was born in Wisconsin under the La Follette leadership. I thought I would be moving to a place that shared my values. However, one of the first things I learned after moving was that Wisconsin had become a model for extreme gerrymandering. Notably, our purple state, where our partisan split is about 50-50, only 36% of the seats were won by the Democrats. This got me interested. How could this be? Well, I've learned a lot about gerrymandering over the past seven years. What angers me and motivates me to help cure our state of gerrymandering is the inherent built-in bias of our redistricting system. How can a system ever be fair if those who stand to benefit most by the results are those that draw the lines? It reminds me of like playing cards with a six-year-old who wants to win and changes the rules as they play. My experience uh, working in industry and medical research has demonstrated over and over the need to have oversight of complex processes to ensure quality and ethical standards are met. Every large manufacturing company relies on a well-defined quality assurance program to keep their processes in track, on track. My time at Anheuser-Busch provided firsthand knowledge of how to set up measurable criteria to follow and ensure that a process is running as expected. It also allows people to objectively make corrections to keep things running as intended. In medical research, we have multiple boards that oversee drug development. Federal regulations and guidelines provide a structure for establishing a research trial. Local ethical review boards protect participants in research trials by reviewing the experimental design 
with a special emphasis on safety. This oversight is an ongoing process designed to assure that the research efforts move according to expectation. The oversight board has the power to halt a research project if safety or other concerns arise. Without these oversight groups, surely shortcuts would be taken to the advantage of some group. It's in our human nature and we've seen this happen many times in the past. And redistricting is no different. District maps have ended up in court every decade since the 1980 census and this 2020 cycle is no different. It's obvious that the current process has too many problems. I think it's possible to create a process to draw district maps that are fair and unbiased towards a particular party. That's what a group of volunteer concerned citizens did from September 2020 through October of 2021. I had the honor to serve on Governor Evers' People's Maps Commission. During these 12 months, the group met to learn from experts in the field of redistricting. We held public hearings across the state, receiving input from thousands of people who cared deeply about their communities and their right to fair representation. While on the PMC, we heard over and over that Wisconsinites were not heard by their elected state officials. All across the state, people told us their representatives were non-responsive to their input. Many races went uncontested because the incumbent success was locked in. People's interest in support of medical care went unheard. Representatives ignored local communities' desires for increased control over their local waterfronts. District lines chopped up communities and school districts in very weird ways. Lawmakers have not taken action on issues that the majority of Wisconsinites support. 68% of Wisconsinites support safe and legal abortion access. 81 support common sense gun laws. 69% support marijuana legislation. This is what happens when for years partisan manipulation of voting maps have allowed elected officials to secure their seat in office without a promise to uphold the will of the people. Our right to vote is precious. As leaguers, we understand this at a very deep level. Our mission is to empower voters and defend democracy. While on the PMC, People across all congressional districts told us their vote doesn't count because the system is rigged to ensure political party, uh, political party stays in power. I heard this in my own community while working on voter registration drives. It was very sad to hear college students, which are our future, tell me that they don't want to bother to vote since it won't make any difference who you vote for. Such cynicism at a young age you know, our democracy um, requires more of our citizens. Certainly gerrymandering has hurt Wisconsin. And these are the reasons why I'm a plaintiff in this case. The current maps are unfair based largely on previously extremely gerrymandered maps. I'd like to see fair maps giving people a fair chance to elect the candidates of their choice. Ultimately, I'd like to see a transparent, fair redistricting process put in place. Thank you. Now, Thank you. you. Yes, uh, I, I am Dee Sweet, and um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about how uh, uh, fair mapping um, is what we deserve as an electorate, uh, particularly in in view of the experience of Native people in Wisconsin. And I'm also going to speak in language that I'm most con uh, comfortable with, and that is non-legalese. But it's a perspective that I feel strongly about, and I've come to it through my work in the area of voter education, voter advocacy. So um, for me, I I was especially uh, pleased and, and uh, just really glad that we remembered um, the legacy of Ada Deer and Dr. Verna Fowler, uh, both of which were mentors of mine. So I just want to say that before I start. 
So for me, I, um, I when I first became involved in this effort, um, I had to go to the dictionary, didn't I? Because I wanted to make sure what we meant in the terminology and the concepts that I was going to be talking about. And so um, I, I wanted to make sure that I understood what, what I meant by um, my desire for fair mapping as a process. And what am I asking for when I, um, when I expect fair maps? And for me, it is um, a representation of what I can expect uh, from legislators that I can also uh, uh, expect uh, transparency, uh, nonpartisanship, and a process that is not self-serving. And if anything, it, it serves your constituency and not yourself. Um, in, in my opinion, and I'm, I'm sure I share this with the leaguers that I, I expect that this democracy lends itself to fairness and in transparency and in accountability. And it is a, a process that is built on um, just having uh, input um, from the electorate, um, asking for uh, public involvement and um, recommendations and desires uh, by the voting public. This is a process that um, sort of is enunciated by um, uh, the census count. And so when we accumulate that data and we put it into, uh, into practice in terms of representation and the distribution of resources and, and um, you know, the recognition of, of what a community requires and deserves, um, I wanna make sure that we understand the history of um, Native Americans and what they can expect from their representatives and how they have been disappointed uh, historically. So those are, um, that's what I'd like to um, start delineating now because there's a lot of, of history to cover. Um, I know that um, in, in a historical reference, I have to talk about uh, racial gerrymandering that began with um, uh, uh, a tax on um, expected to be paid uh, by Native voters. There was also a, um, a condition by which uh, Native voters, if they were going to be um, uh, a, you know, allowed um, uh, the responsibility and obligation to vote, they had to ascribe to the predominant um, culture. They had to be able to uh, uh, speak in English and were restricted from speaking in their own language. And they also had to ascribe to uh, the civilized culture of the time. And I, you know, in my opinion, I'm not quite sure if that, that was a civilized um, uh, culture. Uh, when it came to Native people, we were hardly thought of as, as human beings, let alone uh, active voters. There's a good chance that um, racial gerrymandering um, is, is prominent in the state of Wisconsin. And we know that um, Native people expect that um, what is the point of participating in this process if I can't expect fairness? if I can't expect uh, accountability. And if I assume that there is going to be a, a fair representation of we the people means all the people and, and not just uh, the class of advantage. Um, but that's what we can expect. That's what um, you know we deserve, but that's not what we um, have experienced historically. And even though um, our population in the state of Wisconsin is, is very much, uh, we show up at, at the polls, it's, it's a, a, a responsibility and a right that has been uh, not easy for us. Um, the conditions in, in which we participate in the electoral process oftentimes asks us 
uh, asks of us things that we cannot uh, provide. Um, oftentimes it's assumed that we are going to be represented by you know, the registration process because we have access to the technology. We have um, an availability of uh, broadband connectivity and uh, at least where I live in, in Northern Wisconsin, in Bayfield County, it's it's sporadic. It's unreliable, and there are uh, there are families that don't have access within their their household um, to a laptop to be able to register them, um, themselves uh, for voting, and to um, be availed of the information that is um, is out there for them. So they're they're sort of lost in that whole process. Um, that's taken, I think, taken advantage of, of, of a people who really have so much more to, to concern themselves with, uh, putting food on the table, uh, being the head of a household of a single parent family, or um, not being able to um, have the wherewithal to get to the polls. Um, I know that um, in this past year, I've been involved in working with NARF in um, um, a situation in Menominee County where people, because of uh, the redistricting process, they were confused by where they should go and, and where they, um, out of three different uh, polling stations, where should I go? And some of them weren't able to uh, stay on to cast their vote um, because they just didn't know where to go. And it was, um, they had no more time left. They had to go back to work. So these challenges that um, Native people face seem like they're, you know, they're, they can be uh, remedied. They're not insurmountable, but in many times and in many situations they are. They're very difficult for our elders to be able to um, be a part of the voting process. And when they're not um, properly represented by people of their district, uh, how, can, how can we expect them to feel represented properly? How can we expect them to see as though their government um, addresses them as equal uh, citizens? Um, redistricting, um, affects every aspect of our lives then in one of our, our most fundamental rights as a citizen of this country is not always a done deal for us. Um, we have um, every, um, every reason to want to be able to influence um, a legislator. We are um, bearing responsibility for um, of stewardship, of being uh, the, you know, um, repository of, uh, of vital uh, knowledge of how to maintain um, different environmental uh, ecosystems, for example, or maybe even water quality or access to um, uh, uh, sanitized water. Um, only a small percentage across the country, uh, let me have proper frame of reference, across the country, 75% um, of households are in, in living in inadequate housing and don't have access to clean, uh, clean water. Um, the, uh, the roads in, in our communities are, are hardly maintained, if at all. And, you know, tribal housing is substandard. So who do we expect to solve uh, that issue? Who, who do we expect uh, to really address that issue with us and pay attention to um, the solutions that, that we see, that we see as, as viable um, when we're not even heard? We're not even, uh, we're, oftentimes uh, we're considered a nuisance, the nuisance of native people uh, in large part because our, um, um, our interests, uh, the issues that are, are present for us are not often recognized because they don't have to be. 
um, if if your vote doesn't um, really count, then you're hard pressed to even make the effort. So you know the process of of uh, of fair maps and redistricting, as well as the electoral process, were basically a non-entity in large part to um, to uh, many candidates, I guess. But that uh, I think that that is an egregious error for our state. Our state has um, just you know, an incredible source of, of enjoyment and, and family participation through the water and the beautiful lands, the beautiful park systems that we have in many of our cities. And our educational proce uh, process can be so uh, of a quality nature for our children. But we have to believe that, that they are a part of our, our community. Native, Native kids are important and a part of our uh, community. And I had a person sort of correct me that um, um, the, the school district in, in Bayfield, which has uh, you know uh, well over 80% of a uh, Native student uh, population, and yet and still, um, why are we teaching? Uh, tribal studies. Why are we teaching uh, a tribal language? Is that is that something that we agreed to as a community? And yeah, we did. We did meeting the needs of the people, feeling um, uh, an obligation to provide quality education to all of the children, having a uh, resource and in, in industry and commerce that uh, Native people can also uh, participate in. If that's not a priority uh, for um, a legislative body to see to um, that Native people also have a, a quality experience as American citizens, then you know we're dead in the water. It you know we we very well uh, don't matter. And I've heard uh, people time and again, Native people. Um, um, bemoan the fact that we are responsible uh, for stewardship of the land, for recognizing uh, the, the precious nature of uh, wildlife, of the land, of air quality. And, and I don't think that uh, we do that just for Indian people, do we? Um, we are taking on responsibilities because they are heartfelt and we have no other choice. So when uh, gerrymandering takes um, plays fast and and you know uh, reckless with those responsibilities that we take uh, very seriously, it's because it's not in the best interest of people other than uh, of native people, and we don't believe that. We do it because it's it's a value that uh, we hold dear, and we don't do it just for ourselves, and we don't do it just for the immediate generation. We maintain those values and that uh, ecolo ecological knowledge for everyone. So I, I, I want um, I want the discussion that we have tonight and and the awareness that we're raising is the responsibilities of a citizen. And in this case, and in the native populations in Wisconsin, the responsibilities we take seriously um, uh, need, need to be recognized and need to be attended to. And, and you know, we, um, we value those, uh, those um, that worldview and those principles, but we also need a little bit of help. We need some help in, in um, with the opioid crisis, for example, are we going to get the resources to prevent? Um, nowadays, it's children in middle school who are coming into contact with, uh, you know, the toxic uh, street drug of fentanyl. We know that our our children are uh, leaving school, um, and oftentimes our our young ladies who do not uh, complete the fifth grade oftentimes will end up being heads of household and, and um, caring for families all by themselves. Now, I don't, I don't really want um, 
want you to think that I'm I'm asking for your sympathy or asking for anything other than just a fair chance to ask for what we need in terms of resources and in terms of representation and advocacy. Um, but I, I do think that in fair exchange, um, what we try to um, uh, uh, follow in terms of, of our belief system, our worldview, and our responsibilities as stewards, we, we won't stop doing that. But at the same time, um, the historical kinds of disappointments or disenfranchisement that we've, we've had for, for a long time, or I believe we're working ourselves through that and uh, becoming empowered through education and professional development so that, um, you know, many of our people say, you know, um, we're no longer warring tribes in, in that, you know, in a strict definition, because now we're taking the war to the courtrooms. We're taking um, our, our legal experts from our own communities and making sure that our rights are not violated or, or dismissed or ignored. So there are a lot of uh, other uh, comments that I'd like to make, but I don't wanna take up too much time. But I think, um, I think what I wanna leave you with as, as um, our audience is that Native people do have a particular experience of, of uh, apathy or uh, disenchantment with, with the electoral process, mostly because they, um, they are, they can't, uh, they're not confident that they are being, their values, their issues are being properly represented or even taking, uh, taken into account. And um, we deserve more than that. Um, I guess I, I want to end my comments uh, at this point, and we'll go to Q&A later in our, um, our time together tonight. So I'll wait for that, for your comments and questions. Thank you very much, Miigwech. My goodness. D, what an eloquent, convincing, <laughs> final comment in our prepared program here. Yeah. Um, Joan, uh, John Swartz, the historical aspects, what's gone before to bring us up to where we are now, very important. Explaining the particulars of the legal case that's moving forward. Thanks very much, Dan Lentz. We got to know that stuff. We we uh, try to be a people in a government of law. But uh, Anne Maria McClellan and D. Sweet, uh, your your quiet, eloquent explanation of why you have standing and why you des why you deserve to be heard in the interests of fairness. And with the pur purpose of seeing that input from the electorate has a chance to influence legislative results in the best interests of, of us and our children um, who will inherit, for better or worse, the results of our decisions. So um, with that, I, I had a a couple of questions uh, in my pocket in case there weren't some popping up, but I see that the chat is full of questions. So um, Molly and Brandy. Yeah, I can uh, read the questions from the chat. So the first one we have, um, I believe this was for Dan, it's from Heidi. Would new maps be in place for the primary? And if not, um, are we allowed to put them in place for the general election? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, we are proposing, and WEC has said that maps need to be in place for the primary. They really need to be in place um, by March. So when the announcement as to the elections goes out and when candidates start circulating papers in April and May, 
they know what the districts are. Um, you you really have to know what the districts are well in advance of even the primary to make sure that they're in place for the general. Thanks, Dan. I think we I think the next two are for you as well. Um, how close in population do state legislative districts need to be? Um, they need to be pretty close. Um, we think, you know, when a court particularly imposes a map, they need to have some sort of de minimis, they can have de minimis population variation, but that means like one, two, three percent. Um, so it, it's one of the preeminent requirements for redistricting because it that's how we ensure that everyone's vote has the same weight uh, across the districts. And our next question is from Vicki. Um, what are complications in remedying the contiguity issues in the current maps? Well, the big complication is just how widespread the problem is, right? We're talking about most of the assembly districts and, and near super majority of the Senate districts. And that's one of the reasons that we've told the court that they can't use and, and shouldn't use this least change methodology that they found in Johnson that's not found in our constitution, it's not found in our laws. Um, it was a, a court court imposed doctrine. Um, but that's the big the big thing is that it just affects so many districts. And whenever you're talking about changing districts, you're never talking about it in isolation because if you change my assembly district, you're necessarily changing the one next to it. And you're necessarily changing the composition of Senate districts. Um, so that's the big complication. There are other complications just about the historical issues of, of why these, how these uh, non-contiguous districts came to be. They sometimes follow municipal boundaries, which is lawful, um, but I'm happy if someone wants to talk to me about that individually. It's a, it's a little nerdy, even for this, uh, for the contiguity discussion. Thank you, Dan. Um, and then I received a message from Louise asking if you could clarify the idea that without partisan information, the court may inadvertently impose a gerrymandered map. Sure. So if you think of, of Wisconsin or, or, or most states and, and where different political groupings live, right? Um, Democrats live Democrats live in, in cities and, and suburbs. Um, and, and this is certainly not true of everybody, but as a general proposition, and Republicans live in more rural areas, exurbs, um, other parts of our state. If you didn't know that, and you just tried to like impose a grid on the state of Wisconsin, because of those groupings, you would effectively be handing the Republicans a gerrymander. Conversely, you can do the other way, right? If you were to say, okay, I want to make sure that the cities the cities are, are well represented in, in different ways, you can impose a democratic gerrymander without looking at partisan information. So the court needs to look at that partisan information, the electoral results of the last couple of years, to make sure that they're not putting their thumb on the scale of one side or another, because that's that's not the role of the political of the nonpartisan, non-political judicial branch. Um, they need to make sure they're they're being neutral in that space. Thank you, Dan. That was very helpful. Um, <clears throat> one more question I see for you. Um, wondering if Law Ford wins the lawsuit, will it stop the 2030 gerrymandering? And I think um, just looking for more explanation if there's a connection there. Yeah, um, and, and this is is also a, a question that I know other people on the call have a lot of thoughts on. The answer is no. I mean, our, our case is about the current maps and why the current maps are unconstitutional, what the court needs to do about it. It does not, it would not and could not really change what would happen in 2030 and 2031 when there's new census information. That is something that the league has been very involved in and, and the Fair Maps Coalition has been very involved in is we need um, future looking redistricting reform um, so we're not going back to court every time to try to get fair maps. Um, and really, you know, I think from our perspective, what that would really mean is a constitutional amendment, um, because if the legislature passes a bill, a good bill, a bad bill, they can always take it back, right? If the legislature and the governor are all controlled by the same political party, 
even if you have the world's best redistricting bill on the books, it's only 48 hours away from, from being eliminated. And then they can pass whatever maps they want. So um, our case is about the current maps and why they're bad, but we absolutely need fundamental redistricting reform in this state uh, and the types that other states have, have managed to pass. Thanks, Dan. Um, D looks like our next question is for you, and it is from Carl. Um, Carl's question is, speaking of the Native American vote as both a minority, a sovereign nation, they are spread out across the state. Uh, this prevents them from having representation in our government. And the question is, is it possible that we could do an overlay of a state where they could vote for a representative and a senator? I don't know if I can adequately, you know, sort of envision something like that, but I do know that um, in the in the state of Minnesota, um, the tribes there, at least the, the Ojibwe tribes, um, I don't know about the Dakota, but um, the Ojibwe tribes were were a part of a district district onto themselves, I believe. Something along the order of all seven Ojibwe reservations became a part of a single district so that they could adequately represent the issues um, to, uh, to, to their legislators. And also uh, as a result of that, you know, uh, putting that, that population together as a unified front, they um, were able to uh, convince several tribal members to run for public office. So there's a couple of different, um, I think, benefits to to having this an honest and fair and equitable uh, kind of redistricting. That if we could not split tribes uh, um, or tribal communities, say for example, the Menominees and the Stockbridge, they live in close proximity, and because there are um, you know, uh, def defined by sometimes uh, natural kinds of boundaries. They care about those those rivers and those water systems and you know those those wild rice beds. And you know they don't have to be of the same tribal affiliation. They can be Stockbridge or Ojibwe or Menominee because they oftentimes live um, in the same. Uh, in the same region of our state. So maybe that's uh, a way that we can uh, have a representation of uh, a tribal body consisting of, of several nations. Um, maybe that's one way. Did I answer that question or, or provide one example? I think so. And Carl, if you have any follow-up, feel free to yeah. put that in the chat. Yeah. But yeah, thank you so much, Dee. And Molly, I'm going to jump in here. I see that Heidi Johnson has a question um, saying that it was probably explained, but she missed, would the new maps be Governor Evers' maps? Uh, how will the new maps be determined? And uh, relative to that, I wanted to ask Anne-Marie, based on your professional experience in your career, developing quality processes for assuring that safe medicines get to market, and your experience on the People's Maps Commission, trying to come up with, a, a, pursuing a quality process to come up with the best maps. Do you think, and, and Dan and, and anybody else can, Joan, you can all sing on it. Is it possible to come up with quality maps Not it, we can't just knock down the uh, we can't just holler about the deficiencies of of maps, but we got to come up with good ones. What do you think? Well, I think it's possible, um, but I think um, a well laid out process needs to be put in place even before you start mapping. Um, I think there's a lot of we heard from political science uh, people and experts in mapping across the U.S. when we were um, like doing our crash course as people with maps commissioners, you know, on how to redistrict. And 
I think if you put the process in place and you, they have developed a lot of metrics. And I think that that's part of the problem of why the courts don't want to touch it because maybe they don't agree on which metrics to use because some of them will be metrics for partisan, you know, efficiency gaps, those sorts of things. Um, but if you put that in place and then have a group of people that have um, not a lot of skin in the game of who wins and how the lines are drawn, like alleged, like somebody that's not part of the legislative process or you won't be, your position won't be eliminated based on how those maps are drawn. So either bipartisan or nonpartisan, um, it can be done, but it has to be done very transparently and people have to view the process as it's done and you have to have these measurements to know, you know, to define a fair process. So it's a complex problem, but I think that there's certainly um, ways to improve it. And, you know, I through our efforts in trying to create a fair map with the PMC, I think we learned how difficult it is and that there really is no one perfect map. I mean, there's lots of good ones um so i think you just uh, we need some guide rails set up to say that this these maps are within the bounds of what we think are um fair thank you that makes sense dan and joan you want to um and d any comments on that I can just speak to to how we foresee it working out in the case at least um that the an the answer is absolutely yes there there is a way to get from here to fair maps um much of that at least for the litigation depends on what the court is going to tell us about what they want to see from maps and what process they want to use um and we we think the best process is for the parties based on criteria the court sets to submit maps to a referee, um, sometimes called a special master in, in Wisconsin, we call them referees, um, who's a map making, map making expert, who's a political scientist who can review maps based on the criteria and then tell the, you know, give information to the court as to how they best meet the criteria the court has set. That's what we have submitted. Other parties have taken different tacks. Um, some of which are reasonable, um, but that's what we've suggested because because we believe that once you properly view the districting criteria, fair maps are not only possible but but likely and, and really the right result for Wisconsin. And that's the process that wasn't done last time in the Johnson case. But as a final comment. I gather that it's quite clear we can do better. All right. Um, thanks, everybody, for attending. A feedback survey, survey is available to you, and please share your thoughts. You And you can also submit any uh, comments to our uh, email, our state league email. This session will be available as a recording for you to review or share with others. And thank you so much to all of our speakers and all of you who attended. And do join us on Saturday, get a good breakfast and your favorite beverage and join us back at 10 a.m. on Saturday when we will be discussing the citizen action at the state level regarding proposed state constitutional amendments. There are some important ones there. And then on Tuesday evening, our final session will address overcoming barriers to voting and election administration challenges. So one down, two to go. Good to have you and come on back. <laughs> Good night. And Brandy and Delaney and 
uh, Molly, thank you for making, making the technical parts go without which 